Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for being here. My name is Ryan Katzrozine, and I'm a coordinator along with Dr. Jackie Best and Dr. Chris Huggins of the International Political Economy Network, or IPEN. Uh, this is a research network housed by the University of Ottawa's Center for International Policy Studies. We have another IPEN event coming up next week uh, about extractivism titled Resurgent Resource Nationalism, Comparative Regional Experiences. And that's taking place on Tuesday, March 15th at 4.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Time. And I will uh, try to post the link for that in the chat uh, window for the audience uh, momentarily. I'm really pleased to welcome everyone to this event on the implications of the sanctions uh, for the global political economy. We've assembled a range of expert speakers who've each been asked to share their unique perspectives on this topic with us, and we've given them each uh, only eight minutes to do so. Uh, I have to say that this event was largely born from my own ignorance on this subject, uh, my own desire to learn more. Uh, and so I'm really pleased that we were able to put uh, together such an impressive list of speakers in, in such a short amount of time. Before I do turn it over to our speakers, I do want to acknowledge that the land from where I'm calling in today, as well as the land where the University of Ottawa is based, is unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, this is not something I mentioned just in passing, but rather I want to emphasize how the global crisis we're going to be discussing today reminds us of just how important it is to acknowledge the long-lasting legacy of trauma caused by colonialism and imperialism and neocolonialism. It's a particularly dark irony that the impetus for our event today, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and its unfolding geopolitical implications is mirrored in the European imperial invasions of Turtle Island, which produced untold suffering for the indigenous peoples of this land. And I, I think it's something we ought not to forget as we engage in intellectual discussions about a contemporary form of imperial aggression. I'm gonna jump right into the panel because uh, we only have 90 minutes for our discussion. Uh, and I just have a couple final reminders before I do so. First, if you have any questions, please go ahead and write them into the Q&A feature as they come to you. And uh, we'll have a chance to address the questions once all the speakers have uh, spoken and given their preliminary remarks. If you could, please uh, also indicate if the question is for a particular speaker. Uh, due to time constraints, I will not be providing lengthy introductions for our speakers, uh, as they each have a very long list of accolades, but you can find their uh, bios in the event listing if you would like. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to start off with our first speaker. Uh, joining us from Kyiv, I understand, is uh, Dr. Oleg Nivievsky from Kyiv School of Economics and he will give us a Ukrainian perspective on all of this. So, Oleg. Yeah, hello everybody. You. Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks a lot for uh, having this opportunity to talk and to share my perspective on, on what's going on in Kyiv uh, and uh, in Ukraine overall. <coughs> I'm, um, I'm uh, the vice president for the economic education program at the Kyiv School of Economics and my field of expertise, um, uh, it's uh, agri-food agri economics okay, and, and transportation economics. So I'm, I'm, I'd like to talk about this uh, situation uh, from this perspective, especially from the perspective of global food security, because I'd like to emphasize that, uh, you know, the current war is, is not just about Ukraine, it's about the uh, global and civilized world world i mean there are various you know um, circumstances and implications of that but global food security is one of the most important uh, problems um, so I'm, i will not talk about kind of the the security per se but uh, ukraine is uh, um, you know um, and plus russia because they also involved in that uh, are quite substantial contributors to, 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 to the exports of wheat and corn and, um, and other uh, grains. Uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to wheat, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia make up 30% of the total global wheat trade. 30%, so quite substantial amount. And uh, and when it comes to, to corn, uh, the, uh, the contribution is about the same. A bit lower, but but uh, about twenty percent. But uh, in terms of perspectives, we can sort of uh, 
um, see that you know the world will not have this amount of exports for quite a while and i'll tell you why um, uh, if we look at current situation what's going on uh, in terms of exports uh, we don't have exports going on from ukraine right now as it was uh, in a pre-war time uh, because the ports of the black sea they basically blocked um, and uh, export is not going on out of, out of the ports and the perspective in terms of future production of even the current marketing year pr production uh, next year production sorry are really negative so there's going to be um, so the production shortfalls, uh, a decrease in production is, is kind of inevitable in Ukraine because, I mean, uh, spring works, uh, spring field works are still to begin in, in April uh, when it comes to the spring crops. And we don't know how it's going to develop because there are very shortages that we experience right now, especially when it comes to fuel, diesel. Uh, diesel now is really badly needed for our military forces and also farmers also need it uh, as well and uh, you know in this kind of competition internal competition of course you know we have the priority but still in order to plant the spring uh, the, the spring crops we need diesel and um, i think that the, the ministry and the and the government are working on that because the majority of diesel and and other um, oil products they were coming from russia and belarus about 70 percent of all this uh, fuel was coming from uh from from this uh, from this um, countries and now there are there should be some compensation from other countries so but this is this is about ukraine and russia as well i mean this uh, everything that is come coming out from russia is considered is considered to be as toxic i mean people will, uh, have high risks to to trade with russia right now so that means that there will be no uh, well, presumably no exports from uh, of grain from from uh, from russia and also how they will be dealing with the, with the future crops that's also questionable because i mean they are quite uh, heavily uh, affected by sanctions and uh, that's that definitely will affect the access of farmers in Russia to, to technology, to seeds, to uh, and to um, to machinery, to spare parts, uh, to uh, agrochemicals. So that's uh, and you know that there will be definitely reduced yields in that country. So what's what what we're gonna have is that in the coming, uh, at least from my perspective, that in the coming two three years, there's going to be a substantial shortfall of output and exports from Ukraine. And now, if you look at where this export goes, these are mainly low income countries like uh, Middle East, Northern Africa, and uh, there are. Well, there are already problems with, uh, with uh, nutrition in those countries uh, and there are increased levels of poverty that so that means that the shortfall from ukraine and russia uh, should be compensated in at least to, to to those countries should be compensated from somewhere else but actually speaking there are no countries in the world that this should that they can compensate this shortfall uh in the in the in the short period of time um and uh, it would take like two to three years if if the war sort of ends right now uh, it would take uh, two to three years to uh, you know to uh, to build up infrastructure in ukraine and to and to uh, come back to the previous pre-war levels of uh, of output so that means that it is really bad news for uh, for those countries is and if we take uh, ukraine aside of course but that's a bad bad news for the um for the northern africa countries and for the middle east countries so uh, we can expect uh, i mean some some says that we can expect like hungry rights over there so uh, there is a high risk of uh, uh, problems in those regions and increased uh, uh, immigration emigration from that country so and this these people will come to you know to um, uh, to the countries with a higher level of income so that means europe western europe uh, and the northern uh, northern america so this is additional threat because of the because of the war uh, in ukraine uh, that we have uh, that russia basically started out of course uh, when it comes to uh, food security domestic food security in ukraine there are i mean it's sort of bearable at the moment uh, because uh, there are problems with the cities that are really heavily affected by russian aggression which are basically encircled uh, this is mariupol and chernihiv uh, there are really problems with the with the food supplies in those countries in those in those cities but Kiev, for instance um, there are some you know 
things, uh, but you know it's bearable. So the food supplies are, avail uh, are available. So there are no problems with the with the kind of food security in those cities. So that's uh, sort of uh, take on uh, from my side. Again, this, this is not just about Ukraine; it's about the whole civilized world uh, and the about the global food security. Ryan. Fantastic, Oleg. Like, yeah. That's a perfect amount of uh, time. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll uh, come back uh, with some questions for you later on. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Abraham Newman from Georgetown University, uh, who is an expert on weaponized interdependence, among other things, and very curious to hear your remarks. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Ryan, for the invitation. And I also just want to thank Oleg for those amazing comments and your perspective. Um, coming from Ukraine right now. Uh, I think everybody on the panel, our hearts are with you and we hope that you're safe in this really, um, really sad moment. Um, I, I wanted to make three, three basic points about what we have learned uh, from this current situation in terms of sanctions. Um, the first is I think it really reveals that we are in a new world uh, of economic coercion. One that is based on the structure of global economic networks uh, rather than simply about uh, coercion based on markets and market size. And so, as Ryan mentioned, I've been doing work with uh, Henry Farrell over the last uh, five years or so, well, which we call under the banner of weaponized interdependence. And, and the main idea is that globalization, it, it's not um, the world that we were sold, you know, the Thomas Friedman world where the world is flat and firms are in control and states have been neutered and conflict is over. Uh, but instead, it's a world where global economic networks increasingly have um, points of centralization, places where, because uh, largely because of efficiency reasons, uh, markets centralized around key actors. So you might think about uh, Visa, Airbus, uh, Google. These are all places where globalization is not a land of fragmentation and decentralization, but it's a place of a really concentrated market power within global economic networks. And what we've seen in the Russia sanctions is how the US and Europe uh, together have leveraged those points of centralization to put um, you know, unprecedented pressure on the Russian economy. Um, and so I'll just, you know, they've been reporting about how the domestic uh, Russian aviation system basically will be uh, you know, land bound in a few weeks because they, they cannot receive maintenance parts uh, from Airbus or Boeing. Um, and so it's a place where you see how the global economic network and how it's centralized uh, can be used for immense coercive uh, purpose. And, you know, another example here is um, the Danish company Maersk, which controls the overwhelming um, uh, shipping container industry of the world. And it has also, you know, blocked Russian shipping. And so the point is, it's not about the Danish market, that Denmark is saying you can't you know, sell to us because Russia doesn't really care that much about Denmark, but it's about the structure of these global economic networks. And I could just go on and on about these, about how these choke points have been leveraged in the Russia sanctions uh, in order to uh, really put economic constraints on Russia. Um, th the second point that I wanna make is, you know, where does this go from here? Because I think there's been a lot of attention on the question of could Russia subvert this type of coercion? Um, and, you know, like, could they create their own um, alternative to the SWIFT messaging system, for example? They, you know, they've, they've created something, the Chinese have created something, but could they, could they get around the United States? Or, uh, and and what, I, what I think in the short term is the answer is just, it's very unlikely that they can get out under the thumb of these networks. And it's because the global economy uh, has been restructured over the last 20 to 30 years in a way that there are just uh, a, a landmine of these choke points um, that the Russians would need to circumvent. Uh, and moreover, they rely on the network effects that these, these private networks that other people want to use them. You know, why is the SWIFT messaging system so uh, important? It's not because of Belgium where it's located or because their technology is so amazing. It's that because everybody else is participating in it. Uh, and so the Russians would have to convince other uh, private actors to also, you know, all the private, all the banks basically to, you know, shift over to their system. And they would have to do that at a moment when they're a pariah uh, and where it would be very, you know, 
do you want to give all your information to a Russian-based uh, financial system? So I think that the, uh, in my mind, and this is my second point, is that the real risk is less about subversion by the Russians, whether they could circumvent these types of sanctions, but it's more about overreach by the Western powers. And what do I mean by that? I think it's that, you know, um, there is, I, I think, a giddiness in some corners of, you know, the, the economic coercion land um, to see how powerful these really, these sanctions have been and how quickly they have undermined uh, the Russian economy. And so you, you know, there are reports of, you know, different European um, actors saying, well, this, you know, we'll, we'll bring down Putin with this. And I think that's where th these efforts could really destabilize um, the, the international system, and not just for Russia, but for China as well, when these tools are seen not just as a legitimate way to counter an illegitimate war of annexation, but they start to be used to topple regimes, to target countries for pecuniary interests of an individual state. Um, I just bring up the sanctions that the U.S. used, these similar type of sanctions against Huawei, the Chinese company. And I think it's another example where the U.S. is perhaps using these not just for things that where there's an international consensus as to the harm that's being committed and that we need to stop them, but to you know, specific interests of the United States uh, to go after a specific company or country. And that's when you could risk uh, a kind of escalation that's not about the networks, it's not about subverting the networks, but it's actually kinetic escalation that come, countries decide that their best option is to use force against these types of economic networks. Um, there's a great book by um, um, uh, Nick Mulder, The Economic Weapon, you know, where he traces what happened in World War II and how the similar types of economic weapons really pushed uh, the Nazi government or regime into escalating their territorial claims. And I think that we, you know, we have to think about and, and be concerned about um, how do we prevent that from happening? And I think it's about creating legitimate and targeted goals around what the mission is of such economic uh, economic coercion. And in this case, I think it's um, getting Russia to um, to withdraw from Ukraine and uh, recognize Ukraine's independence. Uh, the third point that I would just want to make is that we are not out of the woods. You know, Russia is this Russia sanctions campaign um, is is just I think a marker for this new world of economic coercion. And what we really need to do is engage policymakers in the West in particular in a, you know, a conversation about what are the ground rules for this type of economic co uh, campaign. Right now, I think people uh, went way beyond anything that was really imaginable even six months ago. If you remember six months ago, people were stammering over the idea of banning Nord Stream 2. Uh, now uh, the BIS just, uh, you know, uh, cut off the Russian central bank uh, from the BIS. I mean, this is a remarkable escalation in what we've ever thought has been possible. And so we need to create um, a strategic language, uh, just like we did around nuclear weapons. You know, we, we created words like the mutually assured destruction, uh, no first use, responsible use, all of these things. You know, we, the academics, along with the policy community, we need to think through, you know, what are the legitimate uh, ways we can use these tools and what are the guardrails that need to be in place in order to prevent them from uh, being used in an irresponsible way. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back over to Ryan. Um, I'm just gonna put in the chat the article that Ryan mentioned, if anybody's interested, uh, and I look forward to the, to the conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was fascinating. And uh, again, right on the mark with the timing, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, so next up on our list, uh, and I should mention, uh, thanks to those who are asking questions in the Q&A uh, function, please continue to do so. And we'll, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can after all of our speakers have, uh, have given their remarks. And I did uh, post a link to the next IPEN event in the chat as well. Okay, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Paula Subachi from University of London, uh, who will give us a bit of a geoeconomic lens on this conflict. Thank you, Ryan, and uh, hello to everyone. And uh, I, um, I'm sitting here in Europe, and uh, and I'm 
finding the whole conversation very interesting. And I, I, my point is about, I tried to explore the uh, power of sanctions and in particular the wider scope of sanctions that have been imposed on Russia um, compared to what happened in 2014. And obviously um, sanctions have an impact the moment then everybody and all the party commit to, 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 to do those sanctions and stay committed. And I'm saying this, again, I mentioned that I'm sitting in Europe because I'm based in Europe. And they, the big debate now is about um, cutting the, um, banning the supply of oil and, and gas from, uh, from Russia, which means a painful impact on Europe, but an impact which is necessary at this point. Um, so these um, sanctions have been much heavier than, than in 2014, where they were pretty, uh, they were rather, rather timid. And, uh, and uh, they have mainly hit the uh, Russia uh, financial, uh, say, uh, his Russia on the financial uh, uh, sector. And uh, um, the most interesting and the most uh, uh, possibly powerful so far uh, sanction has been on the freezing of the foreign exchange reserve than uh, uh, Russian held, uh, holds abroad. And the exclusion, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, the exclusion of Russian banks from SWIFT. And so that means is, uh, um, uh, is a way to uh, curb the payment system on which the export and trade and Russian trade uh, relies on. Um, and obviously being cut out of SWIFT could further undermine uh, the, the way that uh, the Russian ability to conduct international trade by literally undermining the uh, trade settlement. Um, then um, again, the, 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 the rationale behind the sanction was to basically starve Russian of capital and to, uh, to uh, uh, limit all, uh, the access of bank and non-bank uh, entities to international capital markets. Um, obviously, the, uh, uh, the ability of uh, getting a flow of uh, uh, a hard currency as payment of uh, energy uh, export is obviously uh, somehow undermined the power and the, uh, the impact of the sanctions. Um, so far, uh, these sanctions have uh, resulted in a de depreciation of the uh, ruble by roughly 4%, an increase in interest rate and by 20% because that was a response of the central bank uh, to the um, uh, to, to sanctions. And in particularly by cutting this uh, uh, or reducing the ability of using the foreign exchange reserves, that means then the central bank, Russian central bank cannot underpin the value of the ruble. And that really creates problem domestically. Uh, because uh, uh, an increase in uh, a depreciation of the exchange rate means uh, effectively inflation. Um, there was a deep decline in the, of the Russian stock market with assets losing up to 95%, basically now to trading at almost nothing. And, um, and, and more of this impact will come. So the impact on sanctions will build up over time. Um, this is, but you know, it's quite uh, striking the fact that Russia comes, has come to this prepared, economically prepared, because over the last seven years, the whole uh, economic policy was uh, geared about uh, uh, building resilience. And so by uh, reducing the exposure to international to, to capital markets. Um, and so, for example, um, the Russian position, standard position is pretty good and, uh, and is a combination of uh, managing and also the rising prices of uh, oil and, and metals. Um, Russia has a current account surplus, again, is a really good position to be. And, um, and, uh, and that really compensates the fact that since 2014, the uh, capital inflows have been pretty uh, modest because uh, obviously the uh, conflict and the and, and the annexation of um, Crimea uh, was uh, uh, already um, uh, condemned and, and sanctioned. 
Um, so there is be um, quite a lot of uh, build up and uh, and in particular Russia comes to this with uh, more than six hundred billion dollars in foreign exchange reserve. That the the, the action of the the uh, you know targeting the this this foreign exchange reserve was very appropriate because this really is cutting out things. What, what next? Um, as I said, uh, I think there are, uh, and as the, the previous speakers um, suggested, we need to distinguish between short term and long term. So the short term is a, a, a swift action, which basically um, targets the ability of Russia to continue this this war by simply uh, using capital and, and, and trying to uh, to to um, to pay for the war. And in the long term, there are other um, other actions possible. But I think I don't think we it's appropriate to discuss them now because we don't know yet what the end game will be. So I think we need to be focused on the on, on the short term. And as I said, it's very, very important. And uh, we agree, um, as, as the, the United States already suggested, to uh, cut energy, uh, the um, energy and uh, um, uh, export. Um, what is the other issues? What is going to the other problem which will happen next is probably Russia will default on its debt um, simply because uh, by uh, not having access to half currency, it will not be able to pay the interest and, and the capital, and then they need to pay in um, in actually dollars or euros or whatever the debt is denominated. Uh, even if they uh, switch the denomination of the debt to, to, to ruble, uh, but it's still, um, there is still uh, that effectively uh, the um, uh, debt service, debt service is, still, uh, is still outstanding. That could create, create problems for the financial stability worldwide. Um, the good news is uh, uh, we talk about uh, um, a, a relatively small amount, but the bad news is that again, because of the uh, interdependencies, that might, might there might be some uh, other spillovers uh, somewhere else. Um, so the the game is still uh, is still uh, is still uh, is still open. There is more to do, and I think it is very important to um, to, to use the sanctions in an effective way um, at this stage. And, and even be aware of the impact that that will have on, on the rest of the world and in particular on Europe. We heard already the uh, crunch on the uh, food markets and uh, oil and energy and, uh, and, uh, and it's a cost that then unfortunately we need to pay uh, in order to support um, the legitimate uh, right of Ukraine to stay to remain as an independent country. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Paula. Uh, well, again, uh, some succinct uh, remarks. Really appreciate that. And so we'll go right along to our next uh, panelist. Uh, our next speaker is Dan Dr. Daniel McDowell, who's uh, calling in from Syracuse University. Uh, and I, I gather we'll likely speak about currency valuation, but we'll we'll find out. All right, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, listen, Ryan, thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to just first say that it's um, just great to be on a call with so many other scholars whose work I admire and read and use in my own research. Um, and I want to reiterate what Abe said earlier, specifically to uh, Oleg about our uh, hearts being with you um, and the rest of Ukraine. And it's really an honor to be on this call with you. Um, so uh, I'm actually uh, sort of changed course a bit. Ryan sent out some really great questions to sort of animate our thoughts and comments today. And, you know, the first one is actually the one I ended up settling on, which is this question that says, uh, you know, what are the real objectives of Western sanctions? And what are they and are they likely to be successful? So I'm going to share um, sort of why I'm pessimistic about the uh, ability for the sanctions, at least on their own, to bring about a quick end to this crisis. That said, I want to just make it clear that I strongly support the sanctions. And I think that the best course of action we have short of military engagement with Russia, but I'm going to talk about why I'm pessimistic. So um, first off, what, what are the objectives? I think it's important to remember, going back two weeks, which now seems like ages ago, that the initial objective of the sanctions was deterrence, right? The West, especially the United States, was clearly signaling uh, to Russia that uh, swift and costly sanctions were coming if you invade Ukraine. The hope was that uh, it would change Putin's calculus and prevent a war, but ultimately deterrence failed. Um, and in that case, the United States and Europe sort of have to follow through, right? Their credibility is on the line here. If you want to be able to use sanctions as a deterrent in the future, uh, the world has to know you'll do what you say once you say it. 
Um, okay, so now deterrence has failed. Um, that was the initial objective. So now what's the goal? Um, some have been arguing recently, and I think rightly, that this hasn't been articulated as clearly as it, it needs to be. Dan Dresner had an article in the Washington Post uh, the other day that imposing costs cannot be a goal in and of itself. So what is the goal here? So uh, I want to talk about three possibilities that have been sort of batted around out there. One possible goal is that the sanctions are about containment. Um, Paul, I think, talked a, a bit about this, right? That sanctions will weaken Russia over time and degrade its war-making capabilities. Um, Jake Sullivan, uh, Biden's national security advisor, even before the invasion started, kind of was pivoting on some TV shows saying that this is sort of what, what the goals of sanctions were when it was kind of clear deterrence was going to fail. Another possible goal would be coercion, um, that sanctions are going to be so painful that they're going to eventually force a change in Russia's behavior and bring an end to the war and a return of Ukraine's original borders, or at least something close to that. A third possible goal is regime change. And this was uh, mentioned earlier, I think Dave mentioned this, um, right, that sanctions will sort of crush Putin's popularity and bring about a fall uh, to his regime. I'm not going to talk about number three. I'm not a comparative politics scholar. I don't study Russia. But folks that I do trust are pretty skeptical of that being an outcome. So I trust their, their calculus there. Um, as for number one, the, co uh, the containment goal. If this is the goal, um, and I think this is the one that you know, is most likely to be successful, these costs are severe. It's playing the long game, and we need to sort of be aware of what that's going to look like. I think the picture is not pretty, because despite significant economic costs that the sanctions are having, Russia can still inflict, I think, unbearable costs over a long period of time on, on Ukraine. And you don't have to really look too far to see examples of this. Bashar al-Assad in Syria, uh, his economy was equally isolated um, and was actually in a worse position at the start of the war, economically speaking, than Russia, and was still able to, um, as we know, um, right, kill hundreds of thousands of civilians in that conflict with artillery bombs and chemical weapons. So containment, if that's a long-term strategy, I'm not sure we're going to like what that looks like. Okay, so what about number two, coercion? Maybe that's where we should be focusing in terms of a goal here. Could sanctions actually change Russian behavior? Maybe, and and I don't think it's an, it's a you know it's it's not a non-zero outcome, but I do think it's it's still unlikely. Coercing Russia into compliance is going to be difficult, and I'll talk about at least three reasons why I think it's going to be difficult. One is sort of the basic thinking about sanctions; it's about costs and benefits, right? You got to get the costs right. So for sanctions to work, the costs that are imposed have to be greater than the perceived benefits. Uh, from Putin's perspective of continuing with the behavior that brought about the sanctions in the first place, right? He wants to control uh, all or at least major parts of Ukraine. Um, and that's the ultimate goal for him. He sees that as a really important uh, goal to achieve. Um, he seems pretty resolved, right, uh, to, to end up in that sort of uh, outcome. Uh, in fact, he went ahead with the invasion despite clear and repeated warnings that sanctions were coming. And he had lots of previous experience with sanctions, not just in 2014 and 2016 and 2017 for all sorts of things, human rights violations, for meddling in elections, for um, uh, right, uh, the, the invasion of Crimea. So um, obviously these are more severe, but I, I also am not entirely convinced that with this line that you know Putin didn't have any idea that the sanctions would be this costly. Maybe there's some surprise there, but I think he knew what he was getting into and he still went forward anyway. So the fact that deterrence failed, I think that's meaningful. It didn't deter him from going in, so he seemed to be resolved to absorb these costs. Okay, um, in addition to that, um, sort of the cost sort of exceeding the, the benefits of the ultimate goal that he's going for. The cost of sanctions have to be greater than the perceived cost of backing down as well. This is why we hear so much talk about off ramps and how the West has to give Putin ways to save face. So even if Putin's calculus has shifted, oh, these sanctions are worse than I thought. Oh, this war is going worse than expected. That's probably the most important thing, really, I think, for his calculus at this point, is even then, um, it may not be enough, the cost of the sanctions, if he believes that a full retreat without any meaningful gains at this point will be more costly to him than plowing ahead, right? So the costs have to be right. And so it, that's a difficult thing to do. And I'm not sure we, we, we're, we're there yet. Two more reasons why I think um, I'm sort of pessimistic. Um, the second is public opinion. Um, academics that study this have long debated how sanctions impact public opinion. One side sort of has this deprivation hypothesis perspective that sanctions are going to hurt public support for the targeted regime because economic costs that they're bearing and that pressure from the public will ultimately uh, cause um, right, Putin to sort of back, back down from what he's doing. And then on the other side, there's this backlash hypothesis that says sanctions uh, sort of have a perverse effect. They reduce support for complying with the, the sender's demands, in this case, the West, and sort of harden the target's non-compliant um, position. And so both sides can, can produce observational data that support their position, but there's been a number of experimental studies in recent years that look at this 
And the results are, are not encouraging. They largely reject this deprivation hypothesis and support the backlash view. So recent work, and I won't cite studies, but has found various types of economic sanctions and threats don't reduce public support for their targeted government. So in this case, that would be right Putin, but rather increase support for hardline policies. Um, and they don't increase support for capitulation, for give, giving in. Um, we also, in a couple of studies, the, the findings have shown that the backlash effect is strongest when the, 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 the states that are sending sanctions are viewed as adversaries to the target, which would be true in this case. So at least in the short term, again, I'm speaking short term, right? This would suggest that public opinion may actually work against coercive goals by maybe giving Putin a stronger political hand. Now, they don't look at uh, public opinion over the long run, and I could imagine over the next year uh, or so, right, or maybe even a little bit shorter than that, that these costs could get so significant that it shifts public opinion in a different way. But at least the immediate reaction may not be the way uh, what we would hope. Third point, I'll wrap up. Sanctions relief, or sort of why I'm skeptical, is that sanctions relief may not always be credible. For sanctions to effectively change uh, Russia's behavior, Putin has to be confident that if he complies with uh, our demands, whatever those are, they're not as clearly articulated as they ought to be probably, at least publicly, uh, he has to believe that the costs uh, that have been imposed will be quickly removed. The problem with this is that he may not believe that's true. And so why is that the case? Well, even when official penalties are lifted, private market actors don't always immediately return to business as usual, meaning the cost of sanctions could linger well after the official measures have been removed. So you can just imagine a hypothetical Western company that a month ago was considering expansion into the Russian market, maybe investing in the Russian economy. How many of those firms do you think a month from now, if there was a resolved uh, settlement here, would turn around and go back to those plans? I don't think many, because I think uncertainty about what happens geopolitically in that part of the world remains very high. Mistrust in Putin remains very high. Um, or we could think about VTB, VEB, a couple of Russian banks that have been sanctioned. Even if those sanctions are lifted, they have big scarlet letters now. Um, I would imagine many global banks would, would sort of view them as toxic for quite some time. So if Putin doesn't believe sanctions relief is possible, why comply? Complying doesn't even sort of get the costs fully removed in the first place. So for those three reasons, I'm pessimistic. I still think, again, they're the best tool we have and we should use them. Uh, and I'm hopeful um, uh, that they could that they might sort of in the long run uh, exact what we want, but um, reasons to, to be pessimistic, I think. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. This is a, a fascinating discussion so far. Really appreciate it. And I'm glad we have two more speakers now uh, to close up the panel. So next up on our list is uh, Dr. Juliet Johnson from uh, McGill University. It's good to see you again, Juliet, and uh, looking forward to hearing your, your discussion. Well, great. Thanks very much. Again, thanks for inviting me. And I think my remarks are going to um, flow very naturally out of especially what uh, Paula and Dan just said. Uh, it's true that like the speed, scope, and level of international participation that we've seen in sanctioning a major world economy like Russia has, has been stunning, right? Russia's attack on Ukraine, we need to be clear, has united the world's democracies in condemnation and perhaps unusually in action. So we see European, we see North American, and many other um, democratic governments cutting off the central bank's access to the majority of its $630 billion worth of international reserves, banning major Russian banks from the SWIFT messaging system, and opposing targeted financial sanctions on a wide range of individuals associated with the Russian government. There have been a lot of private sector sanctions on top of this. So for example, visas and MasterCards that are issued in Russia no longer work internationally, and internationally issued Visa and MasterCards won't work in Russia. And you see lots of similar financial sector sanctions being imposed now on Belarus too, by the way, which we shouldn't forget. Um, beyond the financial sector, there are sanctions on everything from Russian airlines to the recent decisions by the US and Canadian governments to ban imports of Russian oil and gas. Uh, we'll see to what extent Europe follows that. It's a, it's a much more contentious issue there for obvious reasons. Uh, we've seen private companies joining this mass exodus from Russian markets as well. Um, so even companies with longstanding Russian presences like IKEA have left the Russian market. Um, and here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in the, um, in the chat this really useful list that uh, Yale prof uh, Jeffrey Sonnenfeld has put together. It's a running list of all of the uh, companies that have decided to leave the Russian market. And it's over 300 companies to date that have left over the past two weeks. So this is pretty stunning. 
Um, so in my remarks, what I'm going to do is focus on the financial sector sanctions, since that's the area I know about, um, especially the ones on the Central Bank of Russia, and talk a little bit about the initial effects they've had, how the Russian government has responded, and what some of the longer term implications might be. Um, because before the war, the Russian government had actively built what, uh, what a lot of people referred to as Fortress Russia, right? And this was based on the experience that they had after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. So the Russian Central Bank and other economic agencies worked to try to sanctions proof the Russian economy by building up this vast war chest of international reserves, of diversifying reserves away from the US dollar, and also introducing the MIR, uh, Russian uh, card payment system, as an alternative to SWIFT and to the Visa MasterCard payment systems. And so this made the Russian government pretty confident that it could weather any likely financial sanctions. And I want to point out that in some respects, these preparations did actually make a difference. So for example, because the MIR system has processed most domestic card payments since 2015, Russian issued Visa and MasterCards actually still work inside the country. They'll work there until their expiration dates. Um, the C Central Bank of Russia also still has access to its Chinese yuan denominated reserves, and that accounts for about 13% of the Central Bank's total reserves, which were practically non-existent a decade or so ago. So they've, that diversification has made a, has made a difference. Um, and in addition, um, and, and as others have noted, Western governments have left a big self-serving loophole in the sanctions regime because international energy payments to Russia can still be transacted in foreign currency. Um, now, earlier this month, the, uh, the Russian Central Bank um, you know, had, you know, has uh, in introduced new regulations requiring Russian energy companies to exchange 80% of their foreign currency earnings for rubles. Um, so this provides an important source of funds to support the ruble. Um, and the central bank used a similar measure during the ruble crisis in December 2014 to help stabilize the currency. And at that point, it was pretty successful. Uh, but here I want to disagree a little bit with Dan. And, and I want to say that the Russian government did not expect these sweeping sanctions on the central bank of Russia in particular. And they certainly didn't expect that they'd be imposed in this kind of rapid unified way by countries across Europe and North America. I mean, again, including Switzerland, right? You don't expect the Swiss to sanction you. Uh, remember also that not long ago, cutting Russia off from the SWIFT network was considered to be the so-called nuclear option of financial sanctions. But the power of cut, cutting off SWIFT really pales in comparison to the effect of the sanctions on uh, central bank reserves. It's estimated now that the Central Bank of Russia can't access over half of its reserve funds, and another third is in physical gold that is uh, quite difficult to monetize quickly. So if you combine this with the market panic and bank runs that have resulted uh, from the war, you know, the, C the CBR, the Central Bank of Russia, is pretty rapidly running out of money. So this is why you've seen things like the crash of the exchange rate. It's currently about 130 rubles to the dollar, and it was about 75 rubles to the dollar at the start of the year. Inflation was up 2.2% in the past week. I mean, that's a, in a week. Um, their annual inflation expectations now of at least 20%. And also the latest forecasts um, are that Russian GDP will drop by at least 15% in 2022. Um, now, Russia's done a lot to, to try to respond to this. Again, they've had the forced repatriation of energy earnings. The central bank has more than doubled its interest rate. It's limited the amount of, of hard currency that Russians can withdraw from their foreign currency deposits. Um, it's, it's said it's going to pay its foreign currency sovereign debt payments in rubles for creditors who are in, in unfriendly countries, and there are a lot of unfriendly countries now. It's pretty clear, um, and this is reflected in Russia's sovereign credit ratings, that there's going to be a default on bond redemptions. So in sum, the response, uh, you know, these financial, this, the response to the financial sector sanctions alone, not to mention the wide range of other economic sanctions, um, have been and will continue to cause serious economic hardship in Russia. I mean, Fortress Russia has been breached. The ruble is basically no longer a convertible currency. And this could get worse as well if we add on other sanctions. Um, and in the q and I'd also be happy to talk about uh, 
uh, about China's role in, in all of this. Um, all right, so let me briefly say something about the goal of these sanctions um, and about the issue of regime change. Because, uh, because I, I, Dan didn't want to speak about it since he's not an area expert, I am, so I can talk about it. I mean, I completely agree with Dan that the initial goal was deterrence, that didn't work. Um, you know, there's also the, the, the feeling that we've got to do something. The current goals have changed both to, you know, that of making it much harder for Russia to militarily conduct the war. It may be successful in that way. It's hard to conduct a war if you don't have a lot of cash. Um, but the quiet part is that the idea is to prompt regime change. Um, I agree that there's no way the public is going to, uh, public protests are going to uh, lead to uh, lead to regime change here. Uh, I, I'd encourage you all to take a look at a, an op-ed that Sam Green has in the Washington Post today that's actually more optimistic about regime change than I might have expected. Because he's arguing that because um, you know, regime change might be possible because the war and, and the pain of the sanctions has made losers out of all of the wealthy Russians that Putin's regime has empowered. Um, but again, I remain a bit pessimistic about that, both because Putin's real base is in the security services, um, who, you know, who would lose far more if Putin lost power, and that it's quite difficult to, uh, to engage in the collective action necessary for what is basically an elite coup in a, in a regime like, like Putin. So escalated sanctions are probably more likely to lead to an escalated military response. And I know I'm a bit over my time, but let me just mention three longer term effects of these financial sanctions on Russia and on the international order that I expect. First of all, the Central Bank of Russia's reputation is now in the toilet. It worked hard to integrate itself into the International Club of Central Bankers to introduce inflation targeting, to stabilize the ruble. Um, Elvira Nabulina was named the Central Banker of the Year. Right, no more. I and mean, again, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, suspended the Central Bank from its services and its meetings. Basically, they're out of the club. Uh, Nabulina is actually dressing in black, and this reflects um, uh, the central bank's external isolation and loss of power internally, I think. Uh, also echoing Dan, the economic damage to Russia is going to be long-term no matter what. It's very hard to unwind sanctions. Uh, it's easy to put them in place. It's easy to leave markets. It's not as easy to return. So the wealth and savings of, of many, many Russians are destroyed and, uh, and the ramifications will go on for a long time. And finally, using finance as a weapon will continue to lead potential targets to try to defend against it. As Abe noted, we have concentrated market power and weaponized interdependence. The natural response to that by those who don't control those weapons will continue to be financial nationalism. So I would expect to see more and more extensive alternative payment systems, more diversified reserve bases, more privileging of domestic banks um, and more state ownership and influence over banks. Um, and again, that's, you know, I'm far, I'm over my eight minutes, but happy to talk about any of that more in the Q and A. Wonderful, it's okay you went a bit over because uh, your colleagues uh, were, were under, uh, so, so that's okay. We're still right on time. And once again, excellent uh, uh, remarks, lots to think about. Um, so again, if you are uh, paying attention and have any questions, uh, now's a great time to uh, put it in the Q&A uh, feature for our panelists. We have one more speaker on the panel, uh, Dr. Eva Nanopoulos uh, from the University of London, uh, who will tell us a little bit about the international legal context uh, about this, uh, about the Russian sanctions, or we'll, we'll hear, we'll hear what you, uh, how you phrase it. Thanks so much, Ryan, uh, yeah, for this invitation um, and the opportunity to offer some very preliminary thoughts about how we might want to think um, about the sanctions imposed against Russia. Um, my remarks will uh, largely be addressing the organizers' last question, uh, namely how sanctions fit within the broader history and trajectory of Western sanctions, particularly EU sanctions. Now, it is true that I'm a lawyer, but I won't really enter too much into uh, the legal dimensions. 
I think, however, it, it would be useful for me to say a few words about how I tend to approach these questions, because I think I come at them slightly differently. So the way Western sanctions are typically approached is largely based on liberal assumptions and principles derived from classical economics. Among these assumptions are first, that we live in an era of globalization characterized by equal mutual interdependence. Second, that states and individuals are rational utility maximizing entities who would not act against their economic interests. Third, that economic incentives or threats, such as sanctions, can alter the economic calculus and then therefore shape their behavior. And fourth, that sanctions offer not only therefore a viable, but also a peaceful and more humane alternative to war. Now, I think the present situation really shows us how much these assumptions prevent us from understanding sanction and what's going on. The sanctions did not deter Putin's invasion, and many commentators warn that the latest round of sanctions have no clear objectives or demands. The language of war rather than peace pervades the commentary on sanctions on the side of both supporters and critics. And in line actually with the organizers own framing really, many see them now not as deterrent or coercive, but as essentially punitive measures. Now, to overcome these contradictions, some commentators um, treat ru the Russian sanctions as exceptions. Okay? We are now in some kind of uncharted territory. Now, my starting point instead is that these contradictions are not aberrations, but that understanding them does require us uh, to radically depart from the existing uh, frame of reference and working assumptions. Now, my own frame in my research is one that seeks to take the historical context and material reality of Western sanctions seriously, uh, building on histories and theories of capitalism and imperialism. I understand imperialism and more specifically capitalist imperialism as a global system of exploitation and domination that is structured along gendered racialized and geographical lines and is inherent to capital accumulation, including its tendency towards expansion, concentration, competition, and the production of a global unequal division of labor, both within and between countries. So on that basis, my working assumptions are that A, that the context of sanctions is not one of equal mutual interdependence, but of deep market dependency, competition, and inequality. That it is these characteristics that explain and are being weaponized by contemporary Western sanctions based on the West's own position in this architecture. That in those conditions, um, the West's deployment of economic force must be seen not as peaceful, but as a form of imperial violence, even if it differs quite qualitatively from military physical force. Now, within that frame, how would we approach the West's sanctions, particularly those imposed by the EU? Now, the EU first imposed sanctions in the 1980s at the initiative of the UK government in response to the Argentinian invasion of the Falklands. Since then, its sanction activity has dramatically increased. There are over 40 regimes in place, some designed to implement the UN sanctions, but most imposed at the EU's own initiative, which often reflect the sanctions imposed by the US. In my earlier work, I drew a topology, of, a topology of these sanctions, mapping the ways in which they act as forms of capitalist imperial violence in different contexts. I don't have time to go into the detail now, but one of the distinctions I draw 
is between sanctions imposed largely against weaker, most commonly post-colonial societies in places like Africa, sanctions imposed against rogue actors such as Iran or North Korea, and sanctions imposed in the context of imperial geopolitical rivalries between states, as these are shaped by the competitive logic of capital accumulation. Now, I'm not myself an expert on the relationship between the West and Russia or the EU's interests in Ukraine or Russia's position within this global structure of cap contemporary capitalism. Still, I would tend to place them, uh, the sanctions in this latter category um, as part of the wider and longer term geopolitical rivalries between the West and Russia and what we might say between two rival imperial projects, even if these two projects take on very, very different form. This round of sanctions are not in fact the first to reflect this underlying ideological and material reality. EU sanctions were first imposed against Russia in 2014, following the invasion of Crimea and have remained in place ever since. Other sanctions too could be directly connected to this context from the sanctions against Belarus and the Transnistrian authorities to the sanctions imposed to, su to support the Ukrainian government to recover um, allegedly misappropriated state funds following the fall of the Yanukovych regime. In that context, I think, Western sanctions are not a deterrent but neither are they, strictly speaking, punitive. That is designed to punish Russia for an offense, be it the prohibition on the use of force or the territorial integrity of Ukraine. They are a form of war, not only because of their reach, we have precedents in Iran or Venezuela, nor solely because of their devastating effects that they will have on innocent civilians, or the world economy and society, but because they are embedded in the logic of states competing for economic and geopolitical superiority. Now, Marxist theories of imperialism, for example, have long predicted that the concentration of capital and the transformation of capitalist competition into geopolitical competition between states or indeed between states and regional blocs, um, will have destructive effects. And as war has broken out well, once, out once more, and there are already fears of a global recession, well, it seems to me really that sanctions are part of the problem rather than the solution, and that um, it is ordinary people who uh, once more are likely to pay the price. Thanks very much uh, for listening and I look forward to the, to the discussion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eva. I really appreciate uh, those remarks. And it's really great to have a whole range of uh, different perspectives on the Russian sanctions. Um, I do want to uh, note uh, that uh, we've lost one panelist. Um, Oleg did warn us that there was, uh, due to the, the emergency situation in Kyiv, he may have to uh, uh, leave early. And so that's one of the reasons we had him speak earlier on. And uh, so we wish him well. I hope he's uh, doing well and is safe um, and is not dealing with an immediate uh, emergency at this time. Um, we also have another panelist who may have to leave us uh, shortly. We'll see. Uh, uh, Abraham mentioned he may have to leave at uh, one o'clock due to another commitment. Um, so we uh, understand if you have to leave us uh, abruptly, Abraham. But we still have another half hour or so to go through some questions. So again, please feel free to ask any questions you may have in the Q&A function and we'll try and get to them. Um, just you know, briefly remarking, uh, I was taking notes uh, with all of the uh, interesting interventions we had. And one thing that kind of came to my mind is the paradoxical nature, I think, of, of, of the sanctions in a number of respects. Um, they are, you know, they've been described as vast and, you know, unprecedented, you know, shocking. 
um, and, and you know, uh, incredibly um, wide uh, ranging. But I think we've heard from a number of, of speakers that they haven't necessarily or, or may not necessarily cripple the Russian economy, although maybe uh, Juliet or others might disagree. Um, we've heard that on one hand, they're unlikely to achieve their strategic objectives, uh, that there may even be unintended consequences for these sanctions, but it's also hard to imagine a Western response that doesn't invoke uh, sanctions in some uh, degree. We've heard that, you know, there will likely be pretty severe implications for everyday people in Russia. Uh, but at the same time, um, there's a sense that these, this probably won't result, this what won't catalyze the kind of, you know, popular uprising that might result in regime change. At least the number of speakers kind of expressed skepticism about that likelihood. Um, uh, there's also a sense that the sanctions are invoked as a punitive uh, measure for a very current, you know, very recent Russian action, uh, Russian form of aggression. But there's also a sense that this is a really long term thing that the sanctions are kind of in it for the, the long haul that the implications are going to be long lasting. And so, at least uh, in my uh, non expert view, I caught a little bit of uh, uh, this sort of paradoxical tension between um, the way that the sa sanctions are intended and the way they're going to be playing out. I'm curious to hear from our speakers uh, what they think of that. And I'll, I'll turn that into the form, into a question, <laughs> if possible. Um, and one of the, the sense, one of the senses I get uh, is, and I'm going to ask this question to, to the panelists and then, uh, uh, then we'll turn to the, the Q&A, is that in a certain way, these sanctions kind of are getting locked in or that there's a risk that these sanctions um, might be might not be a, a short term thing, even if there's an, a desire to kind of uh, treat this as a, as a kind of a tool to, to shape uh, uh, Putin's behavior. And I, I guess I want to know um, whether the panelists agree with that. And do you mind if I just I'm just going to jump in. I apologize because I have to leave. And I, uh, I, I am sad that I'm going to miss the rest of this conversation. Um, but, but I do think it's important um, to, to highlight that what has happened, um, I think, has, has very large consequences for the international system, um, in part because of really revisionist uh, activity by Russia. Uh, and so I think when we think about, like, will, will the sanctions resolve quickly, I think it's unlikely because I think Russia is, is, is showing itself as not willing to be uh, part of the international community. And this isn't just really just, you know, American or European, you know, I think there's an overwhelming uh, sense of the world community and outcry uh, that this is unacceptable. And so it's very difficult for actors, whether it's a Russia or whether it's somebody in a, you know, whether it's people at your school, you know, if somebody bashes up some kid in the school ground, you don't, it's just easy, it's not easy to then readmit them into the community so quickly. And I think that that's going to have long term consequences. I also think that the sanctions, you know, it's, there's always this question, do sanctions work? Well, you know, most foreign policy doesn't work, whether it is uh, invasions or diplomacy or any of these things, it's you know it's like direct success that happens immediately is very difficult and it takes a long time. But I think there's no question that these sanctions are having consequences uh, and that those consequences uh, will change how actors behave. Uh, whether it's that you know Putin pulls out of the the conflict, it's unlikely. But I think there's no question that he has reevaluated. What the transatlantic community is about and what it is willing to do. I think Russia and China both saw um, the U.S. and Europe as fragmented and weak and unable to create a poli policy consensus around its Russia policy, and I think that that is now um, evaporated. And so I think that that will have you know very long-term consequences for Russia's uh, geostrategic position vis-a-vis um, -vis the world. Um, and maybe with that, I have to go, and I apologize. Okay, thank you very much again, Abraham. Does anyone else want to comment on the this this aspect? It looks like Juliet, you're jump, going to jump in. Sure, I'll I'll jump in very quickly to just agree with uh, with everything that Abe said. 
Um, and, and, and getting back to the question of what the sanctions are supposed to accomplish, um, again, I don't think they're going to cause regime change, but I do think, uh, I, I, I don't wanna lose sight of one of, the, one of the goals here, which is to make it more difficult for Russia to uh, pursue its military advance in Ukraine, right? Because the sanctions have been implemented in great part because the you know, uh, European countries, you know, NATO, US, Canada are not willing to intervene militarily. Um, but they want to make it, they, they want to do something, they want to do something that's going to hit Russia really hard. Sanctions are, you know, sanctions are the option. Sanctions are the way to do it. Sanctions are the way to make Russia see that this is um, an incredibly serious response, um, uh, that this is a big problem. <laughs> this is a big problem for them, that they are now outcasts in the international community without doing something militarily that would give, you um, that would give the Russian government an excuse to, for example, use nuclear weapons um, if, if NATO is seen to intervene, or to do something um, that would you know, that would give um, that would give the Russian government, and particularly President Putin, a way to easily craft this as no longer being a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, because a lot of Russians in the in the elite and and in you know in in the public who who know what's going on. They're not at all. Um, they're not at all excited about. They're not at all on board with the fact that you know, the Russian military has just invaded a brother country. Um, but the moment that you know, the moment that any other country gets obviously involved militarily, again beyond just sending you know sending weapons and kind of third party support, then it becomes a conflict a very clear conflict between you know, Russia and the West, or Russia and NATO, Russia and, uh, you know, and Europe, the US and Canada. Um, and then you will get the rally around the flag effect um, that, will, you know, that, that, that Putin would in fact be, be counting on to maintain his hold on power. So you know, sanctions, I think in that respect are the, are the best we can do. Um, and if this best we can do also has the you know, has has the has the effect of again making it harder for Russia to you know, to quickly take over Ukraine militarily to you know it prevents it from getting some of the financial resources it needs to pursue um, what again would be a, an extremely expensive war to re to resupply its troops to um, you know to uh, you know, to provide um, new equipment to repair what it has. I mean, we've all seen the that the Russian military is 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 not all that uh, over the over the past over the past few days. If it if it has if they have that effect, then that's uh, then that I think is something that's that's quite worthwhile and uh, and again in its own way uh, quite effective. Looks like Daniel wants to jump in and, and then Eva. And actually, I'll invite all the panelists to turn on their videos for this uh, for the remaining Q&A. Um, thank you for that, Juliet. Uh, Daniel, what were you going to add? Yeah, I'll be brief um, so we have more time for questions and talking. But I want to just um, build on what Juliet just said. So after being sort of pessimistic in my opening remarks, I will say that um, I, you know, again, I agree sort of the best course of action that we have, even if I'm pessimistic, it doesn't mean that the sanctions couldn't actually bring about the outcome that I think we all hope for. And I think that last point that Juliet made, and I sort of alluded to in the remarks, is that the, the lack of success that the Russian military is having in Ukraine is really important. And so we can think about this as a whole sort of package, right, of sort of costs that Russia is dealing with right now. And sanctions alone, I don't think, right, provide the the quickest or even you know the clearest pathway to to getting where we, we want this to end but as part of a broader strategy right the, the the impressive and really important military aid to ukraine right which is obviously having a big impact and helping uh the ukrainian defense forces really inflict significant losses on the russian military to go with the own ineptitude and terrible logistics of the russian army which is sort of an own goal right 
Coupling that with the sanctions, you know, you, you have to think about this over the next few months as the Russian economy feels the bite of the sanctions. And, um, and this is not something I say with any, any joy, but Russian soldiers coming home, um, right, in caskets. And, and that is a tragedy in its own right, because we know about forced conscription in Russia. But, you know, that combination could perhaps create a sort of a toxic political cocktail. I mean, I certainly hope it does. Um, I hope that this ultimately breaks the will of Putin and brings him to the negotiating table. Um, and so, yes, I mean, we've got to do what we, whatever we can do, I think, as from just a normative position and as a policy, I think, strategy. It makes sense. Um, and it's helpful that Russia is struggling as much as it is to, uh, to achieve its military objectives. Okay, thank you for that. Eva, you, we wanted to jump in? Yes, just uh, I wanted to add something because I think uh, Ryan actually you said you you don't know very much about sanctions, but I think you pointed to something quite crucial, this idea of paradox actually of sanctions, which has been also present in the literature writing more generally about sanctions for a long time now, and I think what we tend to forget here, but generally in public discourse, is how much of an anomaly sanctions are within the sort of ideological apparatus of, 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 of liberal democracies. Because we tend to all, always emphasize more the kind of democracy versus authoritarianism, you know, of Russia. And, and the fact that, of course, um, if, if, you know, only with democratic states can we hope to achieve sort of world, uh, world peace, really. And that these kinds of authoritarian elements are what actually destabilizes the global order, causes insecurity, etc. But there's another principle. So we focus on political liberalism, but economic liberalism, right, is based on a, also another premise that we tend to forget, which is that it is free trade, supposedly, that is designed to deliver peace and amicable relations, that this is a conduit through which um, we can achieve a sort of peaceful international order. And sanctions in that frame are a complete anomaly particularly when they are supposedly uh, imposed, so restrictions on trade and exchange and production, et cetera, are imposed in the name of peace, of securing peace. And I think this anomaly is something that we ought to be taking seriously, uh, because then when it comes to concrete reality, how, how do these principles kind of, where do they lead us? Okay, uh, thank you for that, uh, Eva. I wonder if there might be an opportunity to, to ask uh, a question from the audience about the role of China here. Uh, and that came up uh, earlier in, in the discussion and Juliet mentioned um, uh, that if people had questions about China to, to go ahead and address them during the Q&A. Uh, there was a question from Evan very, uh, you know, basically about China's role in all of this and curious to hear all of the speakers um, uh, answers to this. Could their close relationship with Russia, um, you know, undermine the reach of the sanctions? Yeah, I can, uh, I can start, I can start this off since I promised I would be willing to say something about it, but I'd love to hear what other people say as well. Um, I mean, the interesting thing here is that as far as I can tell, China is not actively helping Russia financially right now. Um, and uh, and I know I'm in a I'm in I'm in a network with a with an actual China expert um, Elizabeth Wishnick and she wrote a, a very short uh, commentary today noting that for now China appears to be complying with financial sanctions. Um, she pointed out that China's commercial banks aren't providing financing to Russia. Um, the China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has put its loans to Russia and Belarus on hold. Um, there's some talks of China's cross-border interbank payment system uh, helping Russia work around its SWIFT ban, but it's actually not a viable replacement. Um, and another thing we've seen, we've seen today is that China is actually easing government exchange rate controls to allow the ruble to fall faster against the yuan. So, you know, so again, China, China, I believe, knows where its bread is buttered. It's a much closer, it's got a much tighter, closer economic relationship with um, with the U.S. in particular, but um, but with Europe as well, than than with Russia, and China is not China is not interested in having Russia damage those relationships. It might end up helping Russia a bit under the table. Um, I, 
you know, I, I, if I remember correctly, Dan, in your piece on gold, you said, well, maybe, maybe Russia can end up selling some of its physical gold under the table to China, you know, sending trains of it to China or whatever. Yeah, they might, they might very well be doing, willing to do that. They would love to take advantage of the situation to get, so, to get their hands on some more gold. Um, and, uh, and, and I could also see you know, the Chinese leadership being, uh, being interested in taking advantage of the situation to put this put the squeeze on Russia in a lot of in a lot of ways. Um, they they're in a they're in a very advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis Russian assets at this point since Russia has no other partners. Uh, but in terms of actively helping Russia to um, avoid the effects of especially the financial sanctions, you know, on a on a scale that would make a, a difference in terms of um, in terms of Russia's Russia's ability to kind of recover economically, at least so far, I don't see it. Okay, thanks. Uh, does any any other uh, panelists want to comment on China's role in all this? I know Paula, you've written quite a bit about uh, China. Not to put you on the spot. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Um, yes, China is actually, as usual, is very ambiguous about this. But obviously, uh, there is no, there is no need, and there is no appetite in China to be involved in this. Not least because there is a big financial, there will be a big financial loss. Because okay, there is um, it, there is a renminbi uh, swap agreement uh, between these uh, the two central banks, which is a tiny amount um, of money compared to what is actually at stake. And so we talk about 150 renminbi and which is about $30 billion. The, the point is then to be effective here, what is needed are dollars more than renminbi. And, and China is aware of this. And China is the only country that can actually rescue, help Russia uh, but they won't, and it won't because there will be some substantial losses uh, and possible, you know, a protracted, um, protracted uh, sanctions, and uh, which will be uh, affect China as well, and particularly on trade and finance and so on. Of course, there are some uh, pre-existing commitments uh, with Chinese entities that are considered by the Chinese government as private entities. So they're nothing, even if they are effectively state-owned companies, but they are considered uh, independent. So nothing to do in other words with the Chinese government. And these are pre-existing commitments. So it would be interesting to see whether these, uh, in particular the policy banks will, be, will pull out of Russia, but I don't think so because again, it would be, very difficult and complicated. It would be, on the other hand, interesting to see whether they will continue to dip and to pursue their engagement in Russia. And then again, in particularly, in particularly the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which I believe it, it will follow the, the line of the other multilateral development banks. But if that's the case, if that's how China China is going to to relate here, is are we saying that Russia is essentially a, a pariah state um, indefinitely for the future? Is it should should we be thinking about Russia almost like North Korea, or is this or is there something else going on here? And well, and that maybe is a, a clear way to articulate what I was trying to ask earlier. Sorry, Ryan, to jump in. Um, the, the point is, and again, it's back to sanctions, there is a short-term impact, and we all discussed that. Um, one reason also to, um, to go heavy on sanction is to punish a behavior which is unacceptable, right? And so whatever is the the uh, the outcome, if I don't it, again, these are sanctions are not conceived uh, to push Putin to change his, um, his uh, behavior because that was already factored in. The thing is on the long term is China, uh, Russian is basically already, but it will continue to be cut out from the rest of the, the world in the trade links, financial uh, channels, um, development finance, 
and everything which is conceivable. Yes, China is on the trajectory, on the path to become like North Korea. Not a great, uh, uh, not a great place to be, but that's exactly where we are heading to. And in particular, if this conflict will continue, because at the moment we don't see a, an end game with, you know, besides possibly and unlikely, the withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine. But again, the situation will remain hugely unstable, which means then again, nobody will touch the Russian economy. I mean, pushing, uh, putting uh, uh, capital into Russia um, at all, because the risk is so high and we continue to be so high. Then, and, and we saw it already, if you compare the current situation with 2014, now 2014 seems very mild. And 2014, the result was effectively very modest capital inflow into Russia. And Russia is a developing country, is a country, an economy which hasn't transited yet to a diversified economy, is dependent on uh, energy and commodities. And again, very easy to, or easy, painful for the rest of the world as well, but you can cut, um, you know, the to severe, you can severe links there as well. So it's, it's very, it's 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 not a strong economy and and that is going to hit the sanctions and the protracted sanction obviously assuming that nobody will defect is will 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 continue to hit russia and the trouble is and the painful thing is then you cannot uh, somehow uh, sanction as not uh, the impact is not uh, sort of selective and so, unfortunately, um, Russian people will be hit as well. And that is, is, a, is a pity, it's a, it's a shame, but there is no other way to get out of this. Daniel, did you, you wanted to uh, add on? To yeah, that? yeah, I'll just add a little bit to this discussion about China. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, th I think what we're likely to see is China doing what it often does, is trying to hedge and play both sides as best as it can. Um, Russia is strategically really important for China. China imports a lot of food. Russia produces a lot of food and it's right next door. China needs a lot of energy. Russia produces a lot of energy and it's right next door. Um, China's not going to um, completely turn its back on Russia because um, in the event of a future sort of, you know, conflict cold or hot with the U.S. and the West, um, it's critical for China to have Russia um, as sort of its, um, you know, sidekick, even, even if it's now a demoted sidekick. Um, I think we've seen China in the past willing to help sanctioned um, uh, countries. China's purchased uh, oil from Venezuela, even after the United States sanctioned PDVSA, the state-owned oil company, um, immediately China halted payments for a while. And then um, there were reports that China was buying Venezuelan oil disguised as coming from Malaysia. Um, and so China will figure out ways to do this. And I think it's easier with Russia, again, because of the big land border to figure out ways to sort of hide these sorts of transactions. China's bought oil from Iran despite sanctions. So it's, it's been willing to do this in the past. And I think it will do it even more so for Russia, because Russia is far more important to China than these other countries um, in terms of its strategic um, sort of, you know, uh, friendships. Um, but at the same time, it's going to try to sort of minimize the blatant thumbing of the nose of these sanctions because it, it, it think exactly like Juliet says, its economic fortunes are far more tied to Europe and the United States right now. But China is preparing for multiple scenarios. It's preparing for a scenario where its relationship with the West um, maybe um, gets a bit better from these low lows that it's experiencing right now, and it can experience further economic expansion and prosperity. And it's preparing for a world where it faces the fate that Russia faces right now. Faces right now, um, and so um, it's it's going to do what it can, I think, to keep Russia in its orbit. And maybe it's even better for China in the long run if a weakened Russia is now dependent on it, because then it has even more influence over the behavior of Russia. So. Um, that's not to say this is good for China. I don't think it necessarily is, but that might be one one win if you want to look at it that way. Actually, Ryan and and and, and Daniel, I disagree because the game has changed completely. Uh, one thing is about even on Venezuela. Yes, Russia, uh, China has been exposed to Venezuela for a long time. China lost money on Venezuela on debt which never been repaid. Um, Venezuela was a case where the West could not even agree on who was the president and the legitimate president. The game now has changed. 
and Russia, uh, sorry, China knows then the, cha the game has changed. Yes, okay, it could be a political decision to, 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 to support Russia somehow. Maybe there will be a bit of trade on the margin, but the, the basic line is, uh, and, and I might completely be completely wrong, but there is not any interest in China financially, economically, politically to support, to openly support Russia. It might be convenient for China to play an ambiguous role, but I'm waiting and I've been saying for a while, I'm waiting to see what, happened, what will happen to the G20. Don't forget that in 2014, the G7 were the G8 and Russia basically was uninvited. So it will be interesting to see what will happen to the G20 and where uh, China will stand on that if the G20 will, because the China will have to take a decision on this. And uh, well, they will meet uh, uh, in uh, imminently, um, the finance minister will meet uh, next month in Washington. And it will be very interesting to see how they're going to play, play the uh, invitations around the table, let's say, and the membership of the club. And it will be interesting to see what uh, China will do because at that point there will be no ambiguity and they might need to take some kind of position and we know what China position is. Uh, we will know what they, they are thinking. But I don't see any, any uh, advantage for China to support, openly support Russia. Maybe they do with North Korea, but frankly, it's a completely different game now. Interesting to, to hear some different uh, perspectives on, on uh, particularly on China's uh, role and relationship with Russia here. Um, I think we have time for, for one more question from the audience, and I appreciate that some of our uh, speakers have been answering uh, questions directly in the chat feature. So thank you uh, for doing that, especially Dan, you've been <laughs> good on that. Um, one of the questions was about cryptocurrencies. One of the, the uh, audience members asked about, uh, I think it was Tyler Atwood, asked whether this would see the this, this conflict and, and the sanctions in particular would lead to a rise of uh, cryptocurrency and the use of cryptocurrency. Any panelists want to speak to that? Or one might say, you know, we could also ask maybe, will this lead to more regulation, uh, more attention to try to, uh, by the state to try and, get a hold and, and keep track of cryptocurrencies. Not sure if we have any cryptocurrency uh, experts. We can pass to- I, I, I can really briefly, I'll be very sure. quick. And I think like, yes, we will see, you know, attempts. Russia's already, you know, Russia actually basically asked Venezuela to try to create a, a, a oil backed cryptocurrency a few years ago. Again, Russia preparing for these sanctions, which I think it expected were coming eventually because, you know, Putin probably knew this was something he was planning for a while now. So, um, you know, there's been reports about Russian oligarchs, you know, potentially trying to use um, Bitcoin to get around these things. And I think the Biden administration just a couple of days ago announced, you know, an executive um, sort of order to try to look into um, ways to sort of stop this. And I know that Treasury is actively trying to figure out how to, um, you know, prevent uh, cryptocurrencies from being used as workarounds. So I think, yes, we'll try it. We'll see, you know, sanctioned entities trying to use that. And we'll see, um, you know, the, the, the United States and other countries, you know, playing the cat and mouse game of catch up. But just to um, to follow to follow up on that, and so there has been there has been a lot of pressure on the various crypto exchanges to you know, to in, to engage in sanctions. And so, well, I think I think this will I think we'll see the growth. We'll also we'll see the growth of cryptocurrency, but we're also going to see much more intensive efforts by uh, by governments to gain some control over them. Um, and we we may also see. Um, you know, increasing efforts by by a variety of governments to uh, to issue their own digital currencies. Okay, very interesting. I think uh, due to the time, we should probably leave the discussion there. Uh, once again, on behalf of uh, IPEN and SIPS, or the International Political Economy Network and the Center for International Policy Studies at the University of Ottawa, I really want to thank uh, our audience for showing up and also our panelists, particularly for joining in on such short uh, notice. Really appreciate it. It's been a fascinating dis discussion, head spinning as uh, evidenced by my own uh, uh, mental lapse there. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, your, your comments and commentary. Fascinating. And um, I hope you're all well. And uh, let's uh, all hope this uh, awful um, aggressive action in Ukraine ends and uh, we'll approach this next time from the kind of hindsight of, of how awful that uh, moment in history was. But thanks once again.
and uh, stay safe, stay well. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye-bye.